The psalmist says, Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout the ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them and so do all who trust in them O house of Israel bless the Lord well we begin this morning by singing a hymn of praise to the Lord the Almighty the King of creation number 196 
as we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. O Lord, our God, the one God, the true God, the King of creation, who is light and life, and whose kingdom is the realm of life and beauty and goodness, and never darkness and terror and horror and ugly wickedness. We bow before you, Lord, this morning, full of thanksgiving and relief, even as we do so once again amid such stark reminders of the sheer darkness of our world, the darkness of man. And how thankful we are that we can run to you whose goodness and mercy does daily attend us. And who, when the godless are rampant, confounding all goodness, you break forth as light, you scatter the terrors of night, and you do surround us with your great mercy, indeed your everlasting mercy. And how we need that comfort, Lord, today. And so we pray, our gracious Father, draw near to us, to us, your people, your flock, who so need your strengthening words of comfort, of care. Draw near to help us to adore you and to adore only you, to worship and serve you, the true God of earth and heaven, with all that is in us. Guard us, we pray, and, and keep us in your care. Never let us stray, never let us stray away from you and to the gods of this world, the crass perversions and creations of the human heart that makes God in the image of us with all our flaws, our weaknesses, our wickedness. Slay in us, Lord, every impulse that would drive us a way to give ourselves, to give our lives to any, any lesser glory than the true glory of your Son, our great Savior, the Lord of heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord, the one name in whom this morning we bring to you all our prayers, all our requests, all our thanksgiving, all our adoration, the one name alone in which we trust. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a warm welcome uh, indeed to all of you this morning, very particularly if you're visiting with us. Uh, if it's your first time with us here at the Tron Church, then let me extend our warmest of welcomes to you. And uh, we hope we'll have an opportunity after the, uh, the service to meet you and greet you. Uh, and we trust that you'll feel very much at home with us here as a gathering of the Lord's people. You should have, I think, one of these uh, sheets on your chair or thereabouts. Uh, there are lots of notices in there that are important for the church family for this coming week and beyond. Um, there's a reminder there with up-to-date information of one of our prayer partners whom we're praying particularly for this month, Sam and Ruth Lee and their family. Do take that and read it and use it. You'll see there in the middle all the different things going on this week. Notice the things that are in abeyance uh, for the next little while uh, also. Uh, please note that we do have a prayer meeting this Wednesday. Don't be confused because we had one last week. That was a fifth Wednesday. This is the first Wednesday, so it's not a, an even Wednesday. We will be meeting together to pray at 7.30 uh, on Wednesday evening as a fellowship. So do come and uh, join your voice uh, with others then. Uh, on the right-hand side, notice also... Uh, next Sunday the 11th, our evening service uh, will not be here in Bar Street at 6.30 and not uh, at Queen's Park at 4.30. We'll be having a joint uh, evening service across the congregations uh, at the Kelvin Grove building and uh, it will be a service of ordination uh, of uh, Josh Johnson. And uh, we're looking forward very much to having Rupert uh, back to preach and other members of our Didasco Presbytery will be involved. So do come along next Sunday evening and make it a priority uh, and 
that will be a great encouragement, not only to Josh, uh, but to all of us, uh, I'm sure. I'll let you take note of the rest of these notices. Just one other thing, and that is to congratulate Rory Wallace and Rachel Porter on their engagement. And uh, we're delighted to rejoice with them uh, in that happy news. Well, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning. You'll find that in the book of Deuteronomy. We're back into our studies here at chapter 13. And if you have one of the uh, Blue Vistas Bibles, that's page 157 uh, in those Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 13, which belongs with chapter 12 and uh, begins the detailed exposition in these middle chapters of Deuteronomy from chapter 12 right through to chapter 26, which really is an exposition, an application of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that are given by God Uh, to the people of Israel at Sinai. The first command, of course, is that the Lord is the only God, and the second, that there are therefore to be no idols. And so, as we saw last time in chapter 12, there's a great emphasis on the exclusive nature of the worship of the one true God. He's to be worshipped in his place, his way, according to what he dictates, not as everybody sees fit in their own eyes. And chapter 13 goes on, to address the various temptations, lures away from that exclusive worship of the one true God. And so Moses says in chapter 13, verse 1, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder that he tells you comes to pass, but if he says, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, let us serve them, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But if that prophet or dreamer of dreams He shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or daughter, or the wife you embrace, or the friend who is as your own soul, if they entice you secretly, saying, let's go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, some of the gods of the people who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him. Your hand shall be first against him, to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. You shall stone him to death with stones, because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. If you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God is giving you to dwell there, that certain worthless fellows have gone out among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let's go and serve other gods which you've not known. Then you shall inquire, make search, and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true and certain that such an abomination has been done among you, you shall surely put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, devoting it to destruction. All who are in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword, you shall gather all its spoil into the midst of the open square and burn the city and all its spoil with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. None of the devoted things shall stick to your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as he swore to your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God keeping all his commandments that I'm commanding you today and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God Amen 
May God bless to us this solemn reading from his word. Well, we're going to sing now number 723, which is a song that speaks of what's at the very heart of this chapter, and that is knowing and loving the Lord our God through the Lord Jesus Christ as the greatest thing in all of life and resisting all that would draw our heart's love away from him alone. All I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world reveres and wars to own, is spent and worthless now compared to knowing Jesus Christ our Lord. Number 723. Well, as uh, the musicians play now and we have a moment of quiet, our uh, offerings for the Lord's work uh, are received. You might like to read again this chapter we'll be studying in a moment, or perhaps just to be praying quietly for those uh, that you know to be in need, particularly at this time. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received.
Well, let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, once again we find ourselves on a Sunday morning coming before you under the shadow of great evil and wickedness in this latest terrible atrocity and attack at London Bridge and in the Borough Market last night. Seven people now at least have died, many, many more injured, hundreds, perhaps thousands traumatized. We find it so difficult, Lord, in knowing how to vocalize our prayers, how to express the horror, the sorrow, the anger, the pain. But we come before you knowing that you are the all-knowing and all-seeing one. And we come with thankfulness that into your hands we can bring our prayers, our petitions, all the burdens of our hearts, knowing that you are the one above all the leaders of our world, our nation. You are the one in whose hands all ultimate things are decided, all power, all authority is yours. And so, Lord, although we don't understand and cannot compute the mysteries and the marvels of your sovereign providence, we know that your word teaches us that no evil can triumph over your plans and your purposes for this world. Although it may seem to us that the power of man is rampant, his wickedness is on the ascendant, nevertheless, you have shown us above the veil into the great war in heaven of which these manifestations on earth are but a part and you have shown us that the victory is yours and yours alone. And so Lord, with that comfort we draw into your presence and bring our prayers and petitions for this current situation in our, natural, in our national life with the recent uh, atrocity in Manchester just a little while ago similarly in London on Westminster Bridge in these days of up-and-coming election surely a target uh, for the terrorists we pray Lord for our Prime Minister for her government for the security forces for all in authority those who are charged with protecting our citizens with praising and promoting that which is good and punishing and destroying that which is evil. We pray for them, Lord, that you would sharpen their minds, give them the intelligence that they need, give them the powers that they need to respond to this latest atrocity and to establish peace and safety for the people of London and of all our great cities. We think of those closely affected some of the pictures this morning showing buildings right next door and across the road from the Cornell Training Course in London. Many known to us, many of the staff of St. Helens Bishopsgate living just there. We pray for that church and its fellowship this morning as they meet and pray, Lord, that in the midst of these terrible things, there would be a heeding, perhaps, of such wake-up calls to listen and to seek the true God among all the false gods of our world today. We pray, Lord, for our leaders in the nation that they would begin to see through the deception, the sheer lies and deceit of this mantra that all religions are but the same. That exposure would come and that people would turn to seek that which is true and good and right and just in the gospel of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for all of those, Lord, who have opportunities in the midst of this to minister to those who are suffering, whether physically or mentally traumatized by all that's gone on. We pray for every church in that area, the church meeting just on the Borough High Street where our former apprentice Kenan is part of the fellowship. 
and others nearby. We pray, Lord, for your people to be able to have opportunities to witness, to show comfort, compassion, help, and love. We pray, Lord, for our nation. We pray for these momentous times in which we live, not only because of terrorism, but in the aftermath of the referendum about the European Union and in the days just running up to the general election on Thursday. How we cry to you, Lord, for mercy. There we ask for the government, for leaders, better than we deserve. Those who will lead us on paths of wisdom and of righteousness. Your word tells us that governments and the powers that be are ordained by your sovereign hand in your grace and mercy commonly to this world that we should not have complete anarchy and chaos, that each one should not do that which is right in his own eyes, that there should not be wanton power struggles, warring, destruction, exploitation. A privilege would be, O oh God, in this nation for centuries, knowing such relative peace, freedoms, liberty, all of which has been built upon the foundation taught by the Christian church, by your holy word. Yet increasingly, as our nation turns its back, runs away in numbers, completely away from these very foundations, we're seeing such things crumble around us, and no one seems to know why. Open our eyes, we pray, O oh God, the eyes of our leaders, our parliamentarians, Whoever will make up the new cabinet this time next week, whoever will be our prime minister to lead us through these coming years. Oh God, have mercy upon us. And above all, Lord, we pray as your word instructs us to pray for leaders and those in authority that they would govern well and wisely, truly and righteously. That we might have freedom to live in peace so as to speak the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who desires that none should perish but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. May we have, O oh God, a government that promotes the ability of the Christian church in this land to speak ever more clearly and faithfully the truth of your gospel and not fear to do so and not by the pressure of a society gone adrift all around us, abandon the truth and fear for the truth and seek to give the world only what its itching ears wants to hear. But come what may, O oh God, whether helped or hindered by our government and leaders, would you give your church the strength, the courage, the zeal to make known the only name under heaven given unto man by which we may be saved to make known the name of the one who alone is ruler and Lord of this earth and whose commands and rule must be obeyed, but who is himself the great Savior, the Redeemer, who offers compassion, mercy, grace, and forgiveness to everyone who turns away from the siren voices of this world and its idols and turns to him, the one who is the lover of our souls, and the leader of our lives. So Lord, for ourselves, we pray this morning you would strengthen our hearts, challenge each one of us deeply within, and call us afresh to follow you and you alone all the days of our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer as we sing the hymn on the screens, Our Father God who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children. Thank you. 
Well, do turn with me, if you would, to our uh, Bible reading this morning, chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, page 157, if you have uh, one of the church blue Bibles. And that's our chapter this morning, but if we wanted a text to uh, sum up its message, Paul's words to the Corinthian church do just that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. At the heart of the Christian faith is worship of the one true God. And therefore, of course, the corollary that every other God is a false God. Now, of course, it's politically very incorrect to say that sort of thing today in a world that embraces inclusivity and uh, pluralism. And uh, it says that really all religions are equally valid or equally invalid. And uh, you might find the starkness of uh, my statement Uh, troubling. But if we take the Bible seriously at all, we have to say that we find all through Scripture warnings not to stray from this exclusive devotion to the one true God who is the only God and the only Savior for all in this world. In fact, the very essence of sin as the Bible defines it isn't first broken rules, it is a broken relationship. That relationship between God, our creator, and his creatures, uh, the people he has made. And uh, the language that the Bible uses, of course, for that relationship is very deep, it's very intimate, it's the language of marriage. Indeed, marriage is given to man precisely to be a living relationship of that far more important love relationship between God and his people which comes to its ultimate fulfillment in the consummation between Christ and his church. And so sin, you see, at its very heart is adultery. It's breaking faith, it's cheating, it's abusing, it's spoiling that most beautiful and precious of all relationships in the most hurtful and destructive of ways. Sin is a a vicious and a callous crime against God's faithful and beautiful love before it's ever a crime against God's law. Behind all law-breaking is love-breaking, first of all. And that's what idolatry is. It's spiritual adultery. It's giving the love that we ought to give exclusively, completely to God alone, to our maker, to the, the sustainer of our lives, to the lover of our souls, It's giving that love to an interloper, to something or to someone else that we have been seduced into seeing as more beautiful and more satisfying and more fulfilling than the one who actually made us for himself to find our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our joy, our meaning forever in him and in our knowledge of him. And that's how the the Apostle Paul actually describes the very essence of humanity's first sin when he's writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 1. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshipped and served the creature, the created things, rather than the creator. That is, we seek our salvation, we seek our meaning, our identity, we seek our our happiness, our self-worth, our fulfillment, in something or someone other than the God who made us to find it in him. And that thing or that person or that ambition or cause, that becomes what we actually worship in life, whether we know it or not. It takes the place of God, whether we realize it or not. It's your idol. But it's a tragic self-deception. Paul says that that people's thinking has become futile and their foolish hearts have become darkened uh, in behaving like that. And that self-deception leads to tragic self-destruction because created things cannot save us. Mere things can never satisfy us and fulfill us and give us significance, give us meaning, give us security. Just look at the anxiety, look at the drivenness, the dissatisfaction of our world all around. It tells a story. They can never save us, but they can enslave us because we come to serve these things. 
And these things come to control us. They come to rule our whole lives with their demands, with their, their expectations, with their real possessing power. And so you see, the 21st century is just as full of devoted idolatry as every other century has been, whether it's people putting all their hope in political idols, that's all around us just now, or whether it's giving themselves to the beauty idols, the fashion idols of our world that so many people seem to gladly give their tithes and offerings to in huge abundance in order to get that look, to get that feeling, to get that image that they think will satisfy them. Or whether it's the idol of family, so common in our Western culture, where you live for the success, the achievements of your children. Or whether it's the ideal of marriage or the relationship of deep intimacy that you long for. Or whether it's your career or whatever it is, whatever you believe will grant you the life that you long to have. Sometimes it's not a devotion to a bad thing. Often it can be if it's uh, drugs or some behavior that's um, destructive or so on. But sometimes it can be good things, healthy things. But we make these good and healthy things into ultimate things. And we build our life, our meaning, our identity, our hopes, our self-worth all on these things more than we do on God. And whatever you build your life on, you see, whatever drives you like that is what will rule you. It will be your God. And if it's not God, it will be something else or someone else. Bob Dylan was right. You've got to serve somebody. And even as Christian believers, John Calvin, the great reformer, was right when he said the truth is that our hearts are perpetual factories of idols. And that's why again and again and again the Bible warns us repeatedly, flee from idolatry. And so way back here in Israel's early history, that was God's word to his people through Moses. The very first command spoken in the awe and the, the trembling of Sinai was this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And so the second command forbade idols of any kind. No other lovers are to usurp the place of God in your heart. For, said the Lord, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's the way of disaster, he's saying, for you and for your family after you if you go that way of idolatry. Unless we're tempted to think, well, of course, it's different for us. We're New Testament Christians. We're not under the terror of the law at Sinai. Don't forget that the New Testament gives us even stronger warnings. We saw that last week in, in Hebrews 10 with David Jackman, didn't we? How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God himself, profaned his precious blood of the covenant? You see, we know far more even than the people of Israel then knew of the sheer depth of God's love to us to be our Savior. If they didn't escape, says the apostle, when they refused him who warned on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven? For our God, the God made fully and finally known in our Lord Jesus Christ, our God, says the apostle of Christ, is a consuming fire. He burns, you see, with holy jealousy to protect his precious marriage to his people, to you and me. God hasn't changed. And alas, people haven't changed either. And you see, the human heart is still just as prone to unfaithfulness as ever it was. And that's why Paul warns the church in Corinth with these references to the Old Testament, warns them that they'll face the same temptations, the same spiritual adultery, the same snares of sin. And he writes to them, they were a gifted church, a vibrant church, the jewel in Paul's crown in many ways of his church plants. And he warns them, flee from idolatry. Don't you be presumptuous. Don't think that all your knowledge, all your giftedness is going to make you immune from these things. It won't. If you think you're standing firm, if you think you're removable, don't think that. Be careful, lest you should fall. Flee from idolatry, he says. 
Flee from that great sin of unfaithfulness to the true lover of your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that, that Paul says to the Corinthians, you flee from idolatry, is to be humble, is to learn from the past, from the people of God. Learn what your forebears had to learn. Whoever said history is bunk was completely wrong, wasn't they? Because it's whenever the church has forgotten its history that heresy has crept in and been able to flourish. And so along with the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul would urge us to look back to chapters just like these in Deuteronomy 13, where Moses fleshes out, where he applies that second commandment. And Paul says plainly to the Corinthians, doesn't he, these things were written for us who live in these last days so that we will not fall into the same sins as they did. Now we saw last time, a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at chapter 12, we saw this emphasis on the exclusivity in the worship that God demands of his people. All these necessary negatives. Chapter 12, verse 4, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, just like all the people all around you. No, instead, you are to worship, verse 5, in God's place, in his presence, under his direction. Look at the very last section of chapter 12 with that heading there, warning against idolatry. And you see there, remember, he's saying, don't seek insights from all these Canaanite religions around you. That's not enlightened thinking, verse 31. Look at it. It's an abominable thing that they're doing. Flee from that. Flee from idolatry. Flee from all that sort of interfaith confusion. Do what I command you to do, verse 32. No more, no less. That is how you live as true worshippers of the true God. But of course, doing that, especially when the world around you wants you to do the very opposite, is a very hard thing. Because there are so many lures, aren't there, to false worship, to idolatry, to other loves, which so, so easily will capture our hearts. We don't set out to desert God. Of course we don't. No more than anybody sets out to destroy their own marriage by committing adultery. But so easily we can be led astray. And of course the devil, the devil has a PhD in human psychology. There is nobody in the world who better knows your weaknesses and better knows how to trap you, how to exploit those things than the devil. He knows your heart and he knows mine. And he will use the very things that make you most vulnerable and me. That's why we've got to be street wise. That's why we've got to be ready to fight him and sometimes to flee. And that's why Moses didn't stop at the end of chapter 12 here. That's why he gives us chapter 13 to alert us to some of these most powerful lures to idolatry and false worship that we will face in our lives. Because he wants us to be forewarned so as to be forearmed. It's just as we heard last Sunday night from Edward in 2 Peter chapter 3. The apostle and Moses wants us not to be carried away with error so as to lose our stability. All the Bible writers write these warnings to us so that we will show true constancy and not total collapse in our faith. And God will allow us many things that we have to face in life which will test our loyalty to him very severely indeed. Look at verse 3 here in, in chapter 13. That's what he's saying. He's testing us to see whether we really do love the Lord with all of our heart and soul and strength. That's the crucial issue in this chapter. Is the Lord your God really the Lord alone in our hearts? Is he really our great love above all other things? Or to use the much starker language of this chapter, do we really love him enough to execute and destroy all opposition? That's how seriously God takes this, as we can see here. We might feel very squeamish about the language in this chapter, about the actions that God demands of his people then in this chapter. But as C.S. Lewis says, we need to be careful. It's not because we have greater, greater Christian sympathy. It's really because of our appalling moral apathy. Or as Christopher Wright in his commentary says, it's not because we have greater appreciation of human life, but because we have lost all sense of the majesty of God. And so, yes, a chapter is 
in the Bible, a chapter like this, to shock us, to wake us up, to jolt us, to see just how seriously it is to be lured away from loyalty to our true God. It's here to warn us so that that thing will not happen because God loves us, because he doesn't want us to be hurt. He doesn't want us to be damaged and destroyed. Sometimes when as a parent you have to warn your children, it makes them upset, doesn't it? When you shout, don't go near the road! <laughs> and sometimes your child will burst into tears. But you've stopped them from stepping out into the path of a bus or a lorry which would have crushed their little hearts to death. And that's what God is doing sometimes in the Bible. He's shouting to us. It makes us tremble, even weep. It's because he loves us. And he warns us of dangers. So in this chapter, there are three key dangers and temptations that are powerful lures that we must resist if we're going to be true to our Lord Jesus Christ. And the first is there in verses 1 to 5, and it's the lure of very successful and indeed spectacular spirituality. Something very spiritual looking can be a very powerful idol. And what's described in verses 1 and 2 is very impressive, isn't it? Signs and wonders are very impressive in ancient Israel, in first century Corinth, and in the 21st century today. And sometimes these things do happen. They do come to pass. Sometimes there are great movements of real success. And it comes to public notice and acclaim. And when great movements arrive in the church, sometimes they can be very popular, very well known. They get TV airtime. They get column inches. They can excite people. And, and we say, look, isn't it great? Evangelical Christians are getting uh, noticed. They're getting great exposure. Isn't that wonderful? And so, of course, people will listen to what those kind of leaders in the limelight say. They'll be so impressed with what they seem to be doing, they'll listen actually to anything that they say. Even if, verse 2, it begins to lead away from the orthodox truth that they have known and loved and believed. And often, of course, it's very subtle at first, very surreptitious, but underneath, the truth is stark. This message, however it's dressed up, says Moses, is actually saying, come with me and let's serve other gods. And it looks so good, it looks so attractive, so successful. You think, well, it doesn't quite sound right, but it must be right, mustn't it? God must be blessing him. But look at verse 3 again. God is testing us to see if the love of our hearts really is just for him. And we are to test these things too, he says. How? By what he has taught us, by his infallible words and commands. Look at verse 4. The true test is not power or plausibility, even if there is real power. The true test is not success or growth or popularity or pulling power. The true test is God's clear word of command. The truth that he has spoken, the truth that he has written, his commands, his voice that we know. And anyone who leads away from that, says God, however attractive, however successful, is not giving fresh insights from the Spirit of God. Verse 5, he is teaching rebellion against the Lord our God. He's teaching apostasy, idolatry. And that's why this punishment is so severe. It's an evil, says God, that has to be purged from the midst of his people because it's so, so deadly. And sometimes we have to warn starkly against that. I remember some years ago, a popular evangelical leader who was a very big hit with the sofas in the TV studios. He had a lovely, attractive smile, very winsome. But he began to teach, he began to write, urging people to move away from the, the orthodox Christian teaching about the cross of Jesus as the atonement for sin. And I heard that he was speaking in our city and that some here, in fact, were going to go and hear him speak. And so I felt I had to warn against him. And some people received that very badly, did not like hearing those sort of things being said. But that particular man has walked further and further and further away from the truth, has led many, many people with him. In fact, this very week, I had an email from a former colleague here who told me that uh, a young teenage girl in the youth group that he had run for many years had now abandoned the church, abandoned her family, 
was wanting to change her identity and live as a man with a woman. And I think this very weekend was being baptized in a new naming ceremony as a man in the church of that particular Christian leader. See, this is not just about ancient Israel. This is not ancient history we're reading about. Moses is warning us, just as Jesus did, that there will always be false prophets among God's people, luring people away from the truth with very attractive, very successful alternative ways of being the church for today's world. Read Jeremiah 23 or Ezekiel chapter 13. They also warn about those who they say will continually say to those who despise the word of God, it will be well with you. To everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, no disaster will ever become upon you. It's very contemporary, isn't it? Of course you don't need to worry what the Bible says in some of these verses about these things. God will never judge you. God will always affirm you in the choices that you make about your life. Or through Ezekiel, peace, peace is what they say. Don't mind your lifestyle. Don't mind your religious aberrations and experimentations. But no, says God, there's no peace. I'm angry, and I myself will contend against you if you go that way. The Lord Jesus himself warns in Matthew 24 that so it will be to the very end of the world, even the elect church of Christ being, in many places, deceived by such things. That's why we've got such a, a full New Testament with all these letters, every one of them warning us against attractive and successful and very plausible, personable people. Because we're so easily seduced by the lure of what seems to be attractive and, and successful and spiritual. Who doesn't want peace instead of constant struggles and battles with sin? Who wouldn't like to have sudden special waves of blessing and immediate fulfillment instead of the hard road of carrying your cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. Which pastor doesn't want to have praise heaped on them and recognition and buzz and acceptance and all of these things instead of odium and being called a fundamentalist and Bible-obsessed and extremist. And we all know the connotations of that word extremist, don't we, today? Especially today. But God says, no, 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 trust me. There's only one judgment of these and all things that counts, verse 4. It's the Lord's view. It's the plumb line of his words, of his commands, of faithfulness to him. Contrast verses 1 and 2 here, of these stories of great things, with what we're told of John the Baptist in John's Gospel, chapter 10, where people remembered his ministry. And what did they say? John did no miracle. But every word that he said about this man, Jesus, was true. It's not power, it's not glitz, it's not recognition, it's not success that God loves and honors. It's truth told about him, about his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice the end of verse 5 here. It's very revealing. You see, the heart of the pull to idolatry is always a drift away from two things. First, rejection of the true historic redemption of God, the God who redeemed you out of slavery. And second, rebellion against the true heavenly rule of God, leaving the way that he commanded you to walk. Increasing disinterest in the work of the cross and increasing denial of of the way of the cross. That's always the thing that marks the drift from the one true God and the one true gospel, isn't it? Those two things go together. That's why Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Corruption in one always leads to corruption in the other. But no, he says, don't you be lured away by what seems to be so attractive and successful, even spectacular spirituality. Don't be dazzled. Be discerning. Know his voice. Know his clear commands. And purge, banish, put to death all other voices in your mind that would tell you otherwise. The lure of successful, of spectacular spirituality. But there's a second and very dangerous and very painful lure that the enemy uses, and that's in verses 6 to 11. And that's the lure 
of our closest earthly affections, the lure of our heart affections. A brother, a son or daughter, a wife, a friend with whom you're so, so close. And they're the one who, verse 6, secretly, surreptitiously, subtly entices you away from fruitful love and service to Christ and into idolatry, into drifting away and, and eventually denying altogether your worship of him. I think that is often one of the greatest heartbreaks for believers, the lure of those who are so, so close to them in life. You think of young students perhaps converted at university and going home for the summer wanting to serve God in, in Christian camps or missions or whatever it might be and their parents are horrified. They do everything to stop them wasting their time doing that and do something useful instead like earning more money or having an apprenticeship or whatever it might be. Or even worse, when they say they're getting to the end of their university and they say to their parents, well, I'm thinking of training to give my life to mission or ministry, perhaps somewhere else in the world. And even Christian parents often want to get the youngsters to persuade them not to risk their future, not to risk their career. Leave that, leave that a few years down the line and hopefully they think they'll have grown out of it by then. Or maybe the spouse who doesn't share your Christian zeal and verse 6 exactly is it, entices you secretly, the relentless nagging, the pillow talk that wears you down. You're just spending too much time on those church things. What about me? What about the family? Surely you don't need to be quite as serious about church. What about us? Surely God wants you to give time for us. Surely God wants you to be a, a father or a mother for us. Can't you be more normal like other people? It's subtle, isn't it? It seems so reasonable. It's just looking for a, a reasonable compromise. But friends, where it can all end is verse 7. Your life just in its outlook and its priorities and everything else becoming really no different from the people who live from one end of the earth to the other. No different at all. And that so easily happens, doesn't it? There are so many idols. Just take one of the great idols in the world today, the idol of sport, one of the biggest worldwide idols. And certainly Glasgow is no exception. It was Bill Shankly, the famous Scot, the manager of Liverpool, who once said football's not a religion. It's far more important than that. Well, that's true in this city, isn't it? It certainly calls the tune. Old firm supporters will follow their team to the ends of the earth and no expense is spared let me tell you if the Christians in this city spent as much money on the mission of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as the old firm supporters spend on following their God and idol this city would be in a state of permanent Christian revival isn't that right and it's actually interesting to see where even committed Christians when there's a clash between an important church commitment and a sacred sporting event, quite interesting to see where people's real loyalty lies, isn't it? Look at verses 9 and 10. These are awful verses. But do you see what they're saying? Do you see what God is saying? God must come first. Even above those who are closest to you in life and in love, if they would draw you away from the Lord and lure you to other things. Now, of course, these physical sanctions mentioned here are not for us to apply today. We don't live in a theocracy. This was a unique time, in fact, in Israel's history, one of the very, very few when God specifically spoke of judgment in that kind of way. And the New Testament is very clear. Our weapons are not the weapons of this world. The sword is not put into the hand of the church today because we are not the state But none of that fact softens the sharpness or the challenge in these words to us today. Not one bit of it. This is where our Lord Jesus Christ gets the very words that he uses to warn his followers. Luke chapter 13. Unless you hate your mother, your father, your wife, your children, your brothers, you cannot be my disciple. Stark language. Matthew 10, whoever loves his father or mother or son or daughter more than me, that's the point, is not worthy of me. It's just the same. God must come first, even before our closest earthly affections. 
Apostle Paul says just exactly the same thing. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, because it is idolatry. Flee that idolatry, because it's so deadly. If you don't, it will destroy you in the end. And friends, we need to be as realistic about all this as the New Testament is realistic. That's why Paul says... Don't get tangled up in your relationships, especially in your intimate relationships with unbelievers, because they will be a powerful lure to draw you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. It will. Don't do it. Don't think it'll be different with you. You can't think that. And don't let your own marriage, good and healthy as it may be, and your own family and your children, good and healthy as they are, don't let them become the ultimate focus of your life where all your energies all your love all your ambition is found God must come first and in our child-centered obsessed age we need to teach our children that God is more important than them we certainly need to teach our children that they are not God and we are not God's servants and so often how it seems to be today Maybe you're here this morning and you know deep down that a deep and personal relationship that you have is in fact pulling you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be trying to pretend that it's not, but deep down you know that it is. God is saying to you, friend, don't let it, don't rationalize that away. Don't tell yourself you'll be able to handle that. God says no, he knows better. Trust the Lord Jesus because he's jealous for you. He loves you. And because he does, he will not share that deep and ultimate love in your heart with another. And if that's you, God is this morning calling you to be ruthless. Just like verse 10, just like verse 15. It's what Jesus said, cut off that limb, pluck out that eye, so as not to lose the most important thing in all of life, in all of eternity, his love, his promise, his future for you in his glory. Don't let the lure of your closest earthly affections lead you away from Jesus, the true Lord, the true lover of your life. And thirdly, don't let's be beguiled either by this last powerful force in verses 12 to 18, the lure of an overwhelmingly progressive society, where sheer force of numbers, it's the whole city in verse 13, where they cause us to be drawn along into their corporate idolatry by imbibing the air of the culture all around and the customs and the thinking that just are, are pervasive everywhere we go, everywhere we live with everyone we talk to. It's very, very familiar. Every society, every culture has its own sacred idols. The gods of the day that are celebrated, that are promoted, to which everybody must bow down. I remember when I was traveling through India, being told that um, uh, all these different gods of the Hindu pantheon, but uh, in certain places, particular gods were particularly worshipped and venerated. In one place it would be Ram, in another it would be Shiva, and others, others and so on. And our Western culture is just the same today. The passing age of, of modernity, it idolized reason and rationality and science and so on. But of course now our culture today especially worships relativism and human autonomy and self-determination. We idolize in our culture personal choice, personal expression. These are the memes to coin that word that uh, Richard Dawkins used, these ideas that are so pervasive, spreading everywhere in our society. In fact, it's rather ironic because it's phonetically true as well, meme, M-E-M-E, -M -E, me, me, because our world is a me, me, me culture, isn't it? It's my life, it's my body, it's my choice, it's my identity, it's my sexual preference, it's my right to choose, my right not to be offended by anybody else when I do. And so you see, in our culture, there's certainly no place, is there, for this uniqueness of one God who gives meaning, who gives coherence to everything and everyone. And certainly no place for one Lord who rules and commands everyone in his way, in his way alone. That's the one thing that our culture of so-called tolerance simply will not tolerate. 
And the whole culture you see around us speaks with one voice against that truth of God. It's very powerful. It's very pervasive. And it's very pressing on the church to conform to that common view. And especially, of course, today in matters of sexuality, which are so much at the vanguard of that whole movement of self-expression, my identity expressed as I want. When the whole city, when the whole society, just like here, says that that's not idolatry, that's culture. This isn't perversion. This is progress. This is development. This is sophistication. You can imagine what the Israelite prophets in the subsequent generations and their theologians would be saying, well, of course, of course we're very grateful for our past heritage in the, the evangelical Israelite movement. I myself was, uh, was converted under Moses. I was deeply influenced by I'm very grateful to God for Moses. But of course, times change. <laughs> and the church must change. And we've learned so much more about these rich, exciting temple cultures in Canaan with all their sexual expression. Moses couldn't possibly have known all the things that we know. They used to call it idolatry, but we know so much better than that now. And we can see, can't we, what valuable insights they have to offer us. These visual things, these sensual things that are so much part of Canaanite worship. They're actually vital for us as the people of God today. If we're going to get our message out in this post-Moses world. It's very familiar, isn't it? Very contemporary. It's exactly the kind of things that were being said by one of my former theological teachers last week in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland when he was leading a commission that was leading the General Assembly to endorse even more strongly the perversion of marriage that is all around in our society today. Something that I might say 20 years ago he would not have done and would have argued the opposite. But lured by the sheer force of numbers, by the power of a so-called progressive society, the sheer pressure to conform, and that pressure is very intense. It's intense for theological academics because they want and they crave recognition in their field. It's intense for, for uh, churchmen because they crave preferment and position in churches. Indeed, it's powerful for churches, congregations that want a good reputation, want to be recognized in the communities. And because of these things, so many have turned and moved and go on to serve other gods which are no gods and are anti-God. Yes, they use the language of Christ and the gospel and the spirit. They claim the spirit is leading them into new light, new understanding. But as Paul says to the church in Corinth, it's an altogether different Jesus. It's a different spirit. It's a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. In fact, Paul says there to the Corinthians, doesn't he? It's the deceit and the lies of the serpent himself who always masquerades not as a serpent of darkness but as an angel of light attractive plausible successful winsome isn't it interesting that all these people who claim all these things they claim use of all the nice language liberal progressive tolerant inclusive is there anybody who had a contrary view was backward and bigoted and racist and sexist and Neanderthal. Whenever you get somebody who will, will stand up for biblical truth ever on the radio or the television, the BBC always introduced them as the hardliner, the right winger, the fundamentalist. When have you ever heard them say, here's a man who has firm convictions. Here's a Christian who is honorably consistent with the orthodox face. Never. But look at verse 13, you see here, because God doesn't call these people progressive and liberal and tolerant and nice. He calls them, well, the ESV has worthless fellows. NIV, wicked men. They're worthless according to God. They're wicked. And what they promote, look, verse 14, is not helpful progress, but an abomination. And God's people are not to be taken in. We're to root out completely that kind of dangerous influence from his church so that the entire community does not come under the judgment of God himself. See, that's why verse 15 here is so stark. 
It's using exactly the same language of total destruction that was to be meted out on the heinous, horrific evil of those Canaanite tribes that God had tolerated for hundreds of years, but at last had to destroy because of their sheer depth of wickedness. And the point he's making is plain, isn't it? Don't presume that because you use the name Israelite for yourself, you will not come under God's judgment if you go the same way. It's not calling yourself Israelite. It's not circumcision of the flesh that counts. It's an ongoing relationship of faithful obedience to God. It's the true heart circumcision that shows you are really his. That's what matters. And it's shown by your obedience. So don't be taken in. Flee from that sexual immorality, from all other cultural idolatry round about us that would destroy us. See, verse 17 says there are some things that God's people just simply cannot have anything to do with. He says you cannot have the mercy and the compassion of God if you want to keep any of these things, any of that thinking, any of these ideas sticking to your hands. It's vivid language, isn't it? If these things are sticking to your hands, the only thing that will stick to you is the fierce anger and judgment of God. See, friends, the whole Bible tells us that there's no cheap grace in the true gospel of Christ. There cannot be the forgiveness, the compassion, the mercy of God without true repentance. Verse 18, turning away from sin and obeying instead the voice of the Lord, who is, yes, our great and gracious Redeemer, but who is our great and authoritative ruler. So friends, when the world around about us, when the people around about you want you to change your view on the uniqueness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or in the Bible, sexual morality, or any other thing that people say we must do in order to be relevant to the world today, to be progressive, to be heard, don't be fooled. Listen to God's voice. Listen to his assessment. It's not cool. It's not culturally with it. It's not progressive. It's worthless. It's wicked. It's an abomination to go that way. Don't let the gods and goddesses of our contemporary world lure us from the only God and the only Savior. Not the sex gods and goddesses. Not the ideologies, the fashions, the so-called freedoms and fulfillments that have drawn away so many of the inhabitants of our cities. Nor the lure that, that goes by what people might call Jesus, what might seem to be successful, spectacular, and so on, but actually denies his words and devalues the word of God in their life. And don't be lured by the great affections of your own heart, by the people that you love deeply and dearly. Remember at the very heart of biblical faith is that great command to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. I am the Lord, he says. There is no other. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will swear allegiance to me. And for us, of course, the me is the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that we're to love above all others forever and ever and ever. So friends, don't be lured away from him, not by anyone, not by anything. You can trust him. He knows better than we know. And he loves us and he wants all of our heart. You don't want to betray the Lord Jesus, do you? You know that his love surpasses every other love. You know that knowing him, as we sang, is the greatest thing in this world and in all eternity. There's nothing greater than the love of the Lord Jesus to us, and he will never be lured away from us. So let's flee from idolatry and flee to him the one who loves us, the one who gave himself for us, that we should be his forever. And let's make it our business to help one another in this church as brothers and sisters to keep ourselves only unto him for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, as long as we shall live. For he who saves his brother or his sister 
as a wonderful thing and keeps them for all eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know our own hearts are so weak. We are so easily tempted. So as we sang, would you surround us with your protection? And would we commit one another to surround each other with the protection of real, true Christian fellowship? So as never to lure one another away from your love, but to constantly be leading one another back, back to the true Lord Jesus, to the true gospel, by the true Spirit who leads only unto him and never to any other rival. So, Lord, bid every other rival depart from each one of our hearts this day, we pray, and lead us in your righteousness, in your life, and in your great light. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, these are words of strong warning, aren't they? But they are spoken to call us to faith. And so we're going to sing in response number 732. Lord, be my vision supreme in my heart. Bid every rival give way and depart. You, my best thought in the day or the night, waking or sleeping, your presence, my light. Number 732.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.